So we are going to move to our next session. Uh, I'm Gary Miller from Emory University. Um, I'm an academic, which I believe David just indicated makes me non-normal. Um, we're going to start off with uh, kind of following up on this issue. We heard a lot about the issues of communication that were introduced earlier on, um, and we wanted to go into a bit more detail. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah. Um, can we get her first slide up? Um, Sarah Yu is from uh, the University of Utah. There she is. <laughs> uh, and she has uh, her training in oceanography. So she has this background in science and, and environment issues. Um, and then also training in uh, communication, science communication. So she's going to go into more depth about some of these challenges we see uh, around um, this topic of uh, communication. And then after that, we're going to go through a couple case studies and have more discussion on, on these topics. So for that, Sarah. Oh, good, it works. Okay, um, short people problems. Thank you, Gary, for that introduction. Um, so as Gary mentioned, I, I'm actually in my former training a microbial ecologist, and so I'm quite interested in these ideas of the microbiome and things that we've been talking about. Um, but, unfortunately, I have to leave right after this talk to catch a plane, um, so I welcome any questions over email, um, and you'll see my email again at the end of this talk. But, you know, today I'm trying to maybe fill in the blanks for what David described as the up here, right, where all the scientists are and the experts are and the down here, where the people actually using these technologies and obtaining these measurements are. And so, to give you an idea of where I'm going, um, and a lot of this is through, through media, through communication and various forms of media. And so I think it's important for us to set the stage right, of what this looks like, what the media environment looks like, what it looks like um, in the context of scientists and how scientists are using it and how science is being communicated on them. And then thinking about you know, what are the impacts of communications on how we and lay audiences perceive these technologies and ultimately use these technologies, right? That you know, has given rise to a new type of scientist as well as these myriads of citizen scientists that we now have. Um, and finally, I'm going to end with some key considerations for communication and engagement. Again, we're sort of at the very leading edge of these technologies, I think, and we don't quite yet know right, how to best communicate them. But you know, scientists communicating their research outside of their disciplines have traditionally done so through a, a method that involves gatekeepers, that involves mainstream media inter intermediaries who aim to make very complex research very accessible for general audiences, right? So in the traditional model, um, non-experts would turn to science sections in popular mainstream media for information about science, and then science journalists would turn to experts as sources and resources. And this worked okay for a while because our media environment was quite different, right? Uh, we all remember the broadcast era as sort of an exemplar of this, where we had three channels. We had information about science, about civic life, about public affairs on these channels that were generally the same. And, and during this time, we had what we know as the inadvertent audience. We perhaps didn't set out to watch news or you know, any type of information, but we turned the TV on because Law and Order was on after this, the evening news, right? Or CSI was on. And so we had some inadvertent exposure to the information as a community. Um, but now, what we have is this, right? Oh, I forgot to make my Walter Cronkite joke. Never mind. We'll move on. But so what we have now is this, and we have many more media options. This is just a smattering of what we have. And you know, in fact, we can avoid news, and in that news, scientific or even public information altogether, right? Some scholars know this as the post-broadcast democracy, and it allows individuals, um, again, to shut out all of this. As a result, we lack the shared media experience, and we see the decline of this inadvertent audience who was there just to watch entertainment media, but maybe got some inadvertent exposure to civic information. And so a lot of this is taking place online. You know, we know we share personal environmental data online. We've seen already some of those maps. 
And we know from data that people are increasingly turning to online spaces for information. Um, these graphs are from the, a report of the National Science Board, the Science and Engineering Indicators. And when we look at these trends, we see that most Americans turn to the internet for science. In fact, for specific scientific issues, it has been the highest, right, the most popular outlet for information. And in 2014, we had the highest percentage ever of Americans reporting going online. 67% of Americans go online for information about science. And online, we're no longer passive consumers of information. Right? We can produce, we can co-produce, we can share, we can contextualize this information. And in this interactive web 2.0 environment, um, these types of things have consequences on our perceptions, our attitudes, and ultimately how we behave. And so scientists and scientific institutions and the data we generate are you know, enmeshed in these new, and new media environments right, that allow us to share again and contextualize data. And some examples here, I have um, Twitter, right? We have Facebook, a lot of people get, get information from Facebook. I don't think many of us would admit that, but we do. Um, and YouTube, there's all kinds of multimedia technologies, right? If you just started searching this, I took the screenshot yesterday, if you just start <laughs> searching for this, you have all kinds um, of videos. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of ways and the, there's a lot of potential for the online space as a way for scientists to engage, right, and engage and communicate with audiences. And a lot of these audiences who are going to be using um, these tools and these wearables to collect data. But before I turn to some key considerations, I'd like to think about, well, what, what makes scientists do this? Why, why do some scientists do and some don't, right? We're moving into sort of this, in this open science movement we have a lot more transparency. We want this two-way communication, but you know, some of us do and some of us don't. So first, let's start with the why not. Um, the why nots are, tend often to be quite historical and traditional. Right? In, the, in the early 20th century, a lot of uh, publics found out about news through journalism, and it, and it was communication about science was the realm of journalists and reporters, not the realm of scientists. Right? And so, in this sort of context, there is a lot of stigmatization of communicating science by scientists. Um, scientists also point to the absence of clear career benefits as reasons for why they don't communicate, right? There are a lot of other pressures on their time. And again, uh, this norm, this normative perception that only second-rate researchers are the ones that communicate is, is quite persistent. And certainly that's changing. But a third deterrent is that there is a lack of training for communicating for scientists. A lot of us go through graduate school and, and never think about sort of the sociology of science or the social and political aspects of science and how to communicate about them, right? And so there aren't a lot of institutional systemic structures in place to help with communication. On the other hand, um, People, scientists, still engage with lay audiences and lay publics, and there are various reasons, intrinsic and extrinsic reasons for doing so. Some of these are, you know, enjoyment, right, feelings of contributing to society, um, fulfilling a sense of responsibility as scientists that they do this. And then the extrinsic factors are things like increasing their own visibility, the reputation of the institutions with which they're affiliated, and then the, the potential for um, extramural funding if you get this increased visibility. We also have some uh, evidence that scientists who do communicate more broadly tend to also be more academically productive. Um, this, for example, is a study of researchers at the National Center for Science Research in France that shows that uh, those who are more active in public dissemination of science were also frequently be better cited, more published. And more recently, we collected some data on nanoscientists and looked at their H indices and their mentions on Twitter, as well as asked them about their frequency of interactions with Twitter, or with uh, reporters. So just looking at some of the results of this, we see that um, for so here we have a graph that shows the frequency of the interactions of scientists' interactions with reporters. They either had you know, less or more. We just dichotomized this. And then the, the H index, which is sort of a proxy for academic productivity. Um, 
And you see that among those who had, you know, relatively fewer interactions with, with reporters, social media really doesn't do all that much for them. However, among these nanoscientists who had more interactions with reporters, those who were mentioned on Twitter also tended to have higher H indices. And these are all, you know, fairly well cited um, reporters, or scientists, excuse me. I talk about scientists and reporters a lot. So, you know, with that, I'd like to pivot to what are some of the impacts of communication on our attitudes and perceptions, right? So we've set the stage. Let's look at what research and science communication can tell us about impacts on attitudes. And I'll just touch on a few of these. One of these is this idea of social amplification of risk, right? This is um, in risk communication, a, a commonly cited framework uh, for how various risks either get amplified or attenuated in the public sphere. And media and communication are a part of this. And in online spheres, we are a part of this as well because of this two-way communication and this contextualization that can happen. Right. And so I'll just give you an example of the ways in which media can amplify or attenuate risks. Um, these are some results from a study we did re recently about nu uh, risks of nuclear power pre and post Fukushima. And you can see that in some cases, what you're seeing here is perceived risk on the y-axis for various groups in the US, not in Japan. And so before Fukushima, before the accident, Right, we actually see that conservatives had the highest risk, per risk perception about nuclear energy. Right? And there are probably political reasons for this. The Obama administration, for example, was pushing nuclear energy right, quite strongly. Following P Fukushima, however, what we see is the opposite trend. Okay. And so, you know, in this case, media is attenuating risks among some groups. We looked at among conservatives then looked at their use of media and looked at how this changed their perceptions of risk. So in the uh, white bars, you see low media attention. And, and I'm using TV here, but the uh, trends are the same across online media, newspapers as well. Right? So pre-Fukushima, if you had paid more attention to media, right, you had much higher risk perceptions among conservatives. Following Fukushima, however, those risks were attenuated by media. Right? And the opposite is true uh, among liberals. In this case, media amplified those risks. Right? And because of this fragmented nature of the media environment that we have now, where we can attend to information that suits us, that works for us, right, things like this can happen. Um, the other thing that we have online is, is cues, social cues, right? Because of this interactive nature, we can now like things, and that influences how we as lay audiences make sense of them and how we understand and interpret it. And there are also comments, right? We can comment on things, and there's been a lot of research and communication recently about rude comments and uncivil comments, and we know that incivility online can have various effects. It can affect scientific issues. It can affect people's perceptions of scientific issues. And it can affect people's perceptions of the source itself. So, you know, in this online environment, we see that scientists are increasingly taking to social media to communicate. So now we don't have the sort of traditional model of, of experts, right, talk to journalists that then are the gatekeepers for information to publics. Instead, we have people who, scientists who are going online and communicating their work, and that's because they perceive that there is an interested audience, and they're not wrong. There's 67% of Americans who go online for this information. Um, and their use must be increasing among scientists if studies like this can be published, right? That studies that warn against too much social media use at the expense of research. But not only do we see this rise of new types of scientists who are more enmeshed in media, we also see more citizen scientists. This is a screenshot from Aircast that we'll hear about after this. But we see more citizen scientists. We see them collecting data. There's wearables. You can indicate publicly what your data tell you. Right? Um, so this is air casting. I 
This other one is, measures a whole bunch of different things. It measures background radiation levels. It measures nitrates in organic matter, so in your food. It measures um, electromagnetic uh, field strength. And then the last one someone else mentioned earlier today is safe cast measuring levels of radiation uh, in, in Japan. And again, all of this information is put online, on the internet, for people to access. And people are going whether, you know, regardless of what we think about the data quality and whether people should have access to these data, they do. And they are going to form perceptions and opinions about it and perhaps change their behaviors depending on these data. So given that, and if we think that we should communicate and engage as, as a community around personal environmental exposure measurements, um, I think there are some things that we know about communication that is worth keeping in mind. Right, so um, given what some have said about how people form opinions and make decisions, and um, Baruch's talk this morning, right, we need to be cognizant of how we engage public. Specifically, giving people just the facts is not always going to work. Right? Um, in science communication, we know this is the knowledge deficit model, and it's predicated on the concept of science literacy and based on the understanding of scientific facts, the scientific process, um, and science-related policy issues. And even though we know right, that people are not always rational or objective in decision making, this particular model is persistent. We see this a lot. And I think there are some reasons for this. First of all, that scientists are, we, we tend to be trained to be objective, right? We reevaluate hi our hypotheses given data that we get. Um, secondly, the institutional structures sort of encourage us uh, in this way. We lack communication training, right? So if we're trained as scientists and lack this type of communication training, we sort of immediately go to, well, if we give people information, what they're going to reevaluate and change their minds and attitudes toward this. Um, the third thing is that how scientists conceptualize the public, and someone else mentioned this earlier, there is a very us and them dichotomy where the public is looked at and seen as a very monolithic group, right? But in a lot of research, economics, psychology, communication, we know that it, we're not really talking about the public anymore. We're instead talking about publics, right? Groups that are not homogenous. And this sort of monolithic group, this them that we see the public as, we also tend to see sometimes as, as ignorant, right? As very lay audiences. Um, and the last thing is that I think the knowledge deficit model works particularly well for policy design because it is an easy, sort of easy to pinpoint the problem, the knowledge deficit of publics, and then an easy solution to it, education. Um, so with that, I'll turn then to some key considerations if we're thinking about how to communicate right, around these issues. Um, of course, the first one is going to be where are we communicating. A lot of us have online platforms. It's just a matter of deciding which is the best fit for us. And, and we're all going to have, because of this fragmented media environment, going to have multiple presences on multiple types of media. And then I'd like to just go through these five things, right? Keeping, and these are all about um, designing a message, more or less, right? What, how when you, are you going to design your messages to make them understandable and accessible to people? And so the first thing is really keeping it simple. This idea of simplicity refers to, first of all, isolating the core of the message and then keeping that core message compact. Um, of the five sort of ideas I'm going to present here, I think this is most challenging for scientists because we tend to want to say what the nuances are of particular things. Um, and we also suffer from the curse of knowledge. I think most of us don't think this is a curse. But when we're trying to communicate, this is a curse. Right? So there's quite a famous study that's done where um, you had tappers and listeners, and tappers were asked to tap out popular songs on a table and then estimate listener accuracy, right? To what extent do you think the listeners are going to get it right? And unsurprisingly, the tappers' estimates of listener accuracy are much higher than actual listener accuracy because they have the, the musical accompaniment playing in their heads. And this is sort of an analogy for the curse that 
we as experts have about knowledge, right? We can't unknow what we know, and we don't know what they don't know. Okay. Um, so here's a really good example in science of our curse of knowledge, when we think about words that we use that are common, that we all understand as a community, but mean different things, right? Might mean different things to non-expert audiences. It's important to note, though, that um, this idea of simplicity is not the same as dumbing down a message, right? Instead, we can tap into mental schema, mental frameworks that people already have to help them make sense of very complex information. Um, so here are two good visual examples of this, right? The Tony the Frankentiger, <laughs> yeah, that's, he has a name, Tony the Frankentiger, and, and um, this example in the week really taps into our sort of shared mental schema about artificiality, about playing God, right? And so it conveys much more information in this way. Um, the second thing is audience attention, right? And again, in this world of media where we can attend to anything we want to, where we don't have to attend to any science or any public information at all, the key is really to attract attention. Um, and in order to do this, we can violate a familiar pattern, for, exam for example, right? using surprise, using curiosity. Curiosity is a very powerful motivator um, for, for keeping attention. And um, if we look at the gap theory of curiosity, we can create these curiosity or information gaps between what people know um, and what people want to know. Right? And then keeping that and using that as a motivator. So, so, you know, how can we keep these in mind as we think about how best to talk about personal environmental exposure measurements with communities that are using them? Um, I've combined three and four. So, communicating about complex issues to lay audiences, one thing that separates experts and non-experts is this idea that we can think in more abstract terms, right, is the ability to think in more abstract terms. But the public opinion scholar Walter Lippmann, when he was talking about public opinion, he talked about these as pictures in our heads and public opinion as basically a collection of everybody, every individual's pictures in their heads, right? And so by communicating things in a much more concrete way, we can help create those pictures for lay audiences. Um, credibility is something else we draw on a lot as scientists, and we do this in various ways. So online, for example, we do this by highlighting the affiliations with, right, the institutions with which we're associated. But we also know from research that conveying our sort of uh, adherence to the scientific process also ascribes a kind of credibility to us as scientists, right? And this is in line with this open science and transparency movement. Right, I'm being a good scientist, I'm using the scientific process, here, see how I do it, right, and saying, well, I'm credible in that way. And the last one of this um, is using narratives, the power of stories, right? Stories ha are really powerful, and I think, again, someone else had mentioned this earlier this morning, telling stories with these data. Stories have the ability to capture and retain our attention precisely by creating those information gaps. Um, and tend to be very concrete. So uh, in science communication, studies have been done on this particular movie about climate change. And you know, to some extent, there are short-term measurable impacts on audiences who watch these narratives. So for example, when um, asked how likely each one of these events due to global warming is going to occur, watchers, right, their estimation was significantly higher than non-watchers. In a separate study, seen here, for folks that watch, uh, they asked about levels of concern for these various issues before and after the movie, and for climate change, you can see a significant difference after watching that movie, right? But of course, we don't know how long these effects endure. These are short-term effects. But narratives, you know, there's some evidence that narratives are a really powerful way to communicate to audiences. So I think, you know, a, a lot of the takeaways here um, is that we tend to communicate, at least 
scientists in general and science sort of traditionally has tended to communicate using intuition, right? Intuition of what we think people want to know um, and what we think we sh they should know. But I think data-driven communication is a very important part of this. First of all, identifying what the goal is for that communication. And then, again, what are your audiences like? What are the users who are collecting these data like? What do they want? What do they need to interpret this information and to make it actionable and useful for them? And of course, once we have a clear goal and the idea of who our audience is, when we're designing those communications, here are some things that I think is important, that are important to keep in mind. Thank you.